Everybody, welcome to another episode of BHBA Family Law Presents Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren. Along with Lauren Youngman from Youngman Reichstein, I'm Dan Bemmel, financial advisor and certified divorce financial analyst. During each episode of our show, we'll explore our guest's personal and professional history and dig into a meaningful legal topic. Please continue to join us for upcoming episodes. With one exception, always the first Wednesday of the month at 12.30, Bob Brandt in September, Betty Nordwin in October, Joe Manis in November, Judge Elizabeth Scully in December, Christina Royce in January on the 12th, and Larry Ginsburg in February. The links are available in the chat box and on the bar's event calendar. Lauren. Thanks, Dan. And good afternoon, everyone. You will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that's included with your certificate. Family Law Section is sponsored by White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt, and by Our Family Wizard. White, Zuckerman, Warsawski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that supports divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages, and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. That's it for our sponsors, and we can begin the program. I'll throw it back to you, Dan. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, all right. Well, today we're trying something new. We're going to bring on two guests at once, and we couldn't ask for a better pair. Dana Lowey and Doreen Olson of Meyer Olson, Lowey and Myers, uh, MOLM for short, are two of the four founding partners at one of the preeminent women-owned law firms and one of the largest family-centric firms in the country. Both are among the 2021 LA Business Journal Innovator of the Year nominees and have more awards and recognitions than we have time to list. More than that, they're just amazing people. So first, most importantly, thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Hi, guys. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So we want to spend much of the hour talking about how you built and now manage the firm, the culture, challenges there. Uh, and our legal topic today is going to be a discussion around related cases and consolidated actions. But first, let's, why don't you take us back into a little bit of your personal trajectories. So let's start with you, Dana. Uh, what, what brought you to law school first? And what was that experience like for you? Well, I was not as traditional as most of my uh, law school mates at the time because I actually was in real estate for five years before I started law school. And when I was doing the real estate, I said, I can be a real estate lawyer and I'm going to law school. So I, I got into law school. I brought my brother with me because I didn't want to go by myself and ended up there were no real estate jobs at that time. And I ended up actually being a public defender first. And I didn't love that, even though I loved criminal law, but I loved the drama and the trauma of that type of law. So then that led me to family law and to all of these people that I've been working with for nearly 30 years. What about you, uh, Doreen? How did you end up going to law school and eventually ending up in family law? I went to law school with an eye towards politics. I had done an amazing internship in Washington, D.C., and I loved D.C., and I just thought, any way I can get back there, I'm getting back there. So um, I graduated from UCLA. I looked into law school. I went to law school, again, with an eye towards uh, working in the government and politics. And interestingly enough, I got a job just working as a receptionist during uh, while I was at UCLA, um, working for a civil firm. And they had this client there um, who I got became friendly with. And when I was looking in the law school, looking for uh, somewhere to work, he had mentioned, you know, if you ever need something, give me a call. And he was a gentleman uh, by the name of Marshall Zola. 
And so when I was uh, looking for a job as a law clerk, I called Mr. Zola and he was kind enough to let me come interview with him and his young partner at the time, Lisa Meyer, and I became their law clerk. And I've been, after Lisa and Marshall worked together for many, many years, and they dissolved their partnership. And Lisa went out on her own and she invited me to come with her along with a few other attorneys at the office, including Dana. And I've been with her ever since. So I've known no other law career other than working with Lisa and working in family law. So I just kind of fell into it and I never left it. (laughs) Did you ever go back to DC or you just stayed completely out of that world? (laughs) For pleasure. And then my daughter ended up going to college there. So I got to live out my, my fun there uh, through her, but no, so, and not a regret, not a regret. And now Dorian's daughter will be starting law school. Yes. Very excited. Oh, wow. So does she want to follow in mom's footsteps or just anything but family law? Um, You know, I don't think she would be opposed to it because she's found it very interesting and you know, because in family law, you deal with so many different facets of people's lives and experiences. I think that keeps your interest going. Um, but I don't think ultimately that will be something she's going to be interested in doing. I think she'll be a mom girl. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. So, so Dana, when you what uh, unpack the transition a little bit going from ending up working together first and then we'll get into the, the kind of the mom story, but the Doreen kind of gave us a little teaser of, but uh, what specifically resonated with family law that made you uh, happy or made you excited to make that transition? I think I've always just really enjoyed working with people. I like people's stories In family law. You learn so many different interesting things about their various businesses, their personal lives, their children relationships. And I love the dynamics. It's never boring. Everybody has a story and a different set of facts and it's always challenging for that reason. So it doesn't get boring. It doesn't get old. And I'm also fortunate to work with amazing people who are, you know, both my, they're my work colleagues, but they're like my friends and family. So it's been, I consider myself very fortunate that I ended up when I was looking for a job after leaving the public defender's office that I met with Lisa. It turned out she grew up down the street from me and we, there were just a lot of things we had in common and we connected. And I, like I said, I'm very lucky. So, okay. So Doreen, you did touch upon this a little bit. Tell us a little bit more about um, how uh, mom got started. Um, so Dana and I actually were working, uh, with, it was it called firm called Zola and Meyer and we worked there and there was only a few of us. I can't remember how many at the time and the partnership ended up dissolving and Lisa Meyer formed her own firm and she took myself or she asked myself and Dana to come along with her. And we were, I believe it was Lisa Health and Meyer and Associates for about four years or so. Yeah. And then uh, we were fortunate enough and Lisa asked us to become her partners, which we were honored to do. Um, and we've been together. I've been with Lisa since 93. 93. Yikes. Yikes. Um, and a funny story just with Dana. She uh, applied to the firm when I was working there and we didn't, we were in the middle of a trial. We didn't have time to meet with her. So we had her meet us in the attorney conference room at Stanley Mosque. <laughs> yeah, my interview was, come meet me in court. We said hello, didn't talk about law, which was fine because I didn't know anything about family law. Worked up, right? Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, so that's how Dana came to be. And then, so we worked together and then we brought in our fourth partner, uh, Felicia Meyer, who has extensive civil litigation background. Um, and she's been with us probably 15 years um, so really, I mean, the longevity that we have is really kind of stunning, especially when you look, look at how many firms, you know, start and stop. And so we've been together a really long time and our core group um, has also been together a long time. A lot of our associates and also our partners um, have been here 15, 16, 17, 18 years. Along with our staff, I mean, Along with decades. Staff. Yeah. And what do you attribute to that? How do you think that you've made it work for so long? 
You know what? I attribute most of it to um, just having respect for one another. I think we all bring something different to the party and everybody respects whatever that, you know, asset or attribute is and appreciates it. Um, I think also in our firm, treating people equally and with respect is our hallmark. Um, nobody's at a higher level or lower level than anybody else. Um, and it truly is teamwork and everybody's opinions appreciated and asked for and, um, and you get to participate. So if you're working on a case, you know, whether we bill you or not for it, you get to come because we want you to see the fruits of, you know, the work that you put out there. And I think that's why we've kept so many attorneys for so long because they really do get to see their work in action. And I think they learn from that. And um, I think Lisa is one of the best teachers and mentors anyone could ask for. Um, and she continues to do that to that this day, as we all do. Um, so I, I, I just think it's just the environment. I just want to say we have a really good, lovely, healthy environment. And I'd like to add that, um, you know, we have an open door policy here. So people come in and are a little less so since COVID, I should say, but prior to COVID and starting more, people come in, we strategize together. There's never a time where we don't say, you know what, we can always find time to talk to you and go through this with you. And with even our young associates, they have hands-on experience immediately. So for example, Doreen and I are working on a custody case right now. And our most junior associate who just started, she's very involved in the case. She works directly with the client and then does whatever, you know, is coming to court with us, sits in on depositions, as Doreen said. So I think that provides them with a great deal of confidence and they see what they do. When you guys started the firm uh, in, those in those early years, either as individual attorneys or as a group, uh, what, what were the... What were the biggest challenges, uh, either, like I said, either personally or as, as a team? Were there were there white knuckle moments or, or any any particular things that you guys really had to work through early on? You want to take it or you want me to? Um, I'll start and okay. I'm sure you can add. Um, I think. I think in family law, the business kind of goes and ebbs and flows. So, you know, one month you're busting at the seams and then, you know, the next three weeks you could be, you know, taming down and not as busy. And I think always remembering like we're going to get busy again and not being concerned that you're not going to know where your next piece of bread's coming from. And you have to understand and appreciate that you have ways and it's going to be fine, you know, remain confident. And just know the phone's going to ring because it always does. Um, I always like to say that I think family law is one of the only professions that's truly recession proof, COVID proof, um, everything proof. Um, so I think just having faith that we're going to get through whatever, you know, we're dealt with. Like COVID was a, a huge thing to deal, deal with. And I think we came out amazing. We never shut our doors. Um, and we just let people come in or work as they were comfortable. Um, and again, it was just knowing that this too shall pass type of an attitude. And always just remembering to stop and have fun. I mean, we, I think one of our attributes or what we're known for is we have amazing Christmas parties. Um, so we have a lot of fun. You have to laugh where you can. Certainly not at someone's expense, but I mean, you have to keep it light. Otherwise, you know, it gets a little too deep. So um, I think just, you know, continuing to have fun with it. Yeah. And I, I would say from when we started the firm and became partners, there was certainly a transition, you know, turning into a manager and, you know, quality control with our new and young associates and training them. And, you know, basically in, from one of our philosophies is basically nothing goes out without a second pair of eyes reviewing it because we really want to maintain the quality control. And the more people you have, there's more people to manage. So it has, you know, it, it, you know, it has challenges, but a lot of reward. Did the caseload change or like the initial cases, the, the types of cases that you all focused on, was that different at the beginning? Uh, and has that changed over time? 
I think our cases have certainly gotten bigger and more complex and more sophisticated and require, you know, a lot more people involved, other experts, other professionals. Yeah. And now, also the volume. I mean, there's lots of cases. <laughs> <laughs> well, that actually leads me to my next question. Did you start out wanting to grow and to become a larger firm, at least in the context of family law firms, or is it just that you grew naturally and as work came on, you kept adding on uh, more associates? I think it's the latter, Lauren. I think that it was just organic is how we just kind of rolled with it. And, you know, we're of the type you know, it's not like we're going to handpick only, you know, attorneys from certain law schools or, I mean, we think, you know what, if you're willing to work hard and you have common sense and you're a good writer, we're willing to give everyone a chance. So with that in mind, you just keep getting good candidates and it keeps growing. And, and that's probably the only area we kind of, you know, diverted from one another at some point, because, you know, Dana and I are a little bit more um, apprehensive about significant growth, where Lisa's like the bigger, the better. Um, but it's all worked because I think everybody works together so well. And what we've cultivated is um, the senior associates really mentoring our younger associates. So it's taken a little bit of pressure off, you know, the partners in that respect. So it's kind of, you know, working its way through and it's worked nicely. And we now have four other partners as well. And we have an office in Orange County. So we've definitely expanded. And when we first started, we were still in this building, but we were downstairs. And then we moved up here, you know, significantly doubled our space and grew into it. Let's pivot a little bit and talk about your collective approach to advocacy. Is there a defined mom philosophy in terms of case management and working through all the issues that come up during a case? You want, you want to go? You want me to take it? You can. I, I don't know that there's a mom philosophy. I think the philosophy is it, we're going to do what the case merits. And when the cases merit aggressive litigation, that's what we're going to do if, if, if it merits that. However, we're, you know, we also settle cases all the time. So we really kind of run the gamut and we all have different expertise and abilities. And a lot of it is, you know, it's client driven also, you know, if they want the fight, we're going to give them the fight. On the other hand, if they want to settle the case, that's what we're put our efforts for. But basically we can do, we can do it all. So how would you respond to someone who said, who may say the firm overall has a reputation for aggressiveness, is that is that just perception, or is that a, is some of that a reality? I think it's certainly a reality. I mean, I think um, the cases that call for it, like Dana said, um, and you'll see, and we can litigate with you know the best of them, and I think we are the best of them. So if you need us to go out there with guns blazing, and and you see that consistently and getting good results, then that's the perception you know people are going to have. But it's like Dana and myself, I mean, I settle a lot of cases, you know, I don't think litigation is always the best way. So I have somewhat of a different approach than perhaps maybe Lisa has or Felicia has. So we all have a little bit of different approach, but again, I think probably 80% of it is client driven. So irrespective of our approach, again, I think you're always going back to what and how your client wants you to work their case and handle it. Does, does this perception have an impact on your relationship with uh, opposing counsel, especially new opposing counsel who you've maybe not worked with before? Or does it have an impact um, when you appear in front of a new judicial officer? Well, I think that, you know, opposing counsels and, and judges have a great deal of respect for our firm. So I think, you know, that that helps. And quite frankly, you know, when it comes to dealing with opposing counsel, we're professionals, you know, I, I don't take this, this is not my life. I don't take it personally. I try to treat people with respect and dignity. And if they're nasty and if I have to write a nasty letter in return, I do, but that's not my, I don't start off that way. And, you know, something you mentioned that it, a lot of it is client driven. Do you think that 
your firm attracts a certain type of client or do you try to market to a certain type of client or is it again, just more organic? Um, I would say people who want somebody who is going to litigate in a very strong way, they're certainly finding our firm. They're certainly referred to our firm because we have the strong litigation capabilities and we have a really deep bench. So we have the manpower to do that and those, you know, big cases that require a lot of manpower. Um, So I certainly think people who are needing that know where to go. Um, And, you know, family law is a very small community. So we all know each other. We all know how we operate. We all know that sometimes you have to puff and sometimes you, you know, sit back in your chair and you start, you know, settling cases. So uh, we've worked together before. So I don't think there's really anything new that when the phone rings, it's somebody entirely new that we haven't worked with before and figured it out before. So if that's what goes on externally, what about internally you guys touched upon it the legendary christmas parties uh as part of the key to building a coherent culture uh but how else uh and how important has that really been in the development of the firm to to institute a coherent culture over time how how do you how do you guys do that i think it's really important i think that you know, the first Christmas party we missed was last year because of COVID. But I think it gives everybody an opportunity to get together, to see each other, let their hair down, wear their pretty clothes, and just, you know, have a really, really fun time. And we work really, really hard. And it's our way to show that, you know what, we also play hard, enjoy each other's companies. And throughout the year, we also sometimes we have summer parties. Sometimes we just have get togethers in the office. I mean, we try to make time to spend time together socially. Again, the last year is obviously over a year now, been difficult, but it was something we all did. I mean, and everyone participated in as Doreen said earlier, you know, everybody is treated equally. So, you know, we're all interacting, we're all having a really good time and it's really nice to be able to get to know people personally also. And that's how Doreen and I got to be friends. I mean, we were associates together, we hung out. Has, has the culture changed in your office at all during COVID and how so? I mean, I think it's changed in that, I mean, we were never um, big fans, so to speak, of, you know, working from home. Um, so we literally had to change our thinking overnight. And I think to some extent, we realized it's, you know, maybe an arcane way of thinking. It's a newer thing that, um, you know, the younger kids... <laughs> Um, really relate to. So we had to roll with it. And you know what? It hasn't been a bad thing. Everybody has pitched in. Everybody has pulled their weight. There hasn't been a situation where, you know, it's created a huge obstacle. Is it hard? Yeah, it's definitely hard. And we definitely prefer everyone here and want everyone here. But, you know, we had to roll with it. And I think we did really, really well. And I think that's really 110% as a result of our staff, who's amazing, who has made it, you know, a priority to work with the attorneys and to be present when they could. And it's really a testament to our whole administrative staff. It's, they've been amazing. amazing. Um, and I will say also using my favorite COVID word. I mean, I think we've actually pivoted pretty well for a firm that really required everyone to be here, as Doreen said. Mm-hmm. But for, for months, Every Monday morning, we had Zoom meetings with the attorneys, and it's a lot of people on Zoom and really great attendance and went through the cases and where needs were and, you know, kind of ferreted out who needed what. And then we'd have a meeting with the staff. So talk about their needs and what's going on. And I think that really helped. Do you think any of these changes are going to be uh, permanent? uh coming out of covid either what you're describing is kind of your internal processes or things like remote appearances uh externally um and my thought is in terms of our internal workings i mean we really do want people in the office it just is so time consuming if you want to share a document with someone to find the document attach Mm -hmm. it send an email and you know i mean it's so time consuming as opposed to walking down the office and sitting in someone's office and having a dialogue about it. So we definitely prefer everyone to be here. 
Um, I personally, I'm not a technologically savvy individual, so doing things remotely with the court always, you know, made me very concerned of my technology cut out or what have you. But now that I see that it works, I'm kind of a fan of it. I mean, and it's a huge cost saving for the client. Um, and if you're able to do it and effectively, I did, I think uh, Lisa and I have one of the first trials all via Zoom um, with Judge Gordon. And we were very concerned about it. And it was last June and it worked wonderfully. So ever since then, I'm kind of a fan of it. So I'm hoping that kind of sticks. I don't mind that at all anymore. And certainly for short hearings, you know, this continuance oh, yeah. or ex partes to avoid having to spend at least half your day down there. Right. It's, it's really much more efficient. So I think there'll be some degree of hybrid. I think the courts will keep some remote appearances mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, they're, we, we've learned you have to be flexible. Right. One of the things that you mentioned that I want to go back to, you talked about your deep bench. You talked about the structure with the senior associates mentoring the junior associates. From your seat as the partners, what does career progression look like within the walls of Mullen? You know, we don't have anything, any formal structure, but certainly I'm trying to think. I think of our four, like for example, our four other partners. They've been here a really, really long time, and they've been very, very valuable for the firm. Um, you know, we're also looking for people who can bring in business and are able to, you know, tap into new resources. And, you know, so we're, we don't have any particularly formal structure. It's, you know, kind of a default kind of thing and organic. But Andy, When does somebody become responsible for that, for bringing in business? Is that really just self-motivated? We're open anytime. <laughs> Door <is> open. <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, I mean, we encourage, you know, the um, associates to go to, you know, bar events, to go to different business mixers, to host a party for the soccer team. I mean, amazing how many people you meet at those soccer events, um, you know, so to go out and, you know, we'll get invited to an event and we'll always take an associate with us and introduce them to people that we know. Um and amazingly, they have really great ideas um, since they're all, you know, complete mavens at the social media and all that kind of things that are foreign to us. Um, they're really great at it and they have really great ideas. So we actually learn from them a lot in terms of how to use technology and social media to our benefit. Um, so, I mean, I think it's we share ideas on how to do a lot of, you know, business connections and go out and market and. So um, it, it's been, you know, and I think that's something that just comes with as you continue on in the business. I mean, I think for some people are just natural, you know, handshakers and rainmakers. Um, so it comes naturally to them. I think other people, you really have to get comfortable with yourself and your credentials and work the system. And I think that just comes with time. And I think, you know, you, you know, you have your contacts already. I mean, your law school classmates, I mean, there's, there's built-in potential business opportunities. I mean, I know when I first started for a long time, you know, I was going out all the time with business colleagues. We went out all, all the time, had a lot of fun. I met really great, interesting people. So, you know, you're developing personal and professional relationships. And uh, another thing that I've been thinking about with this uh, conversation, how do you balance running the firm as a business with your everyday workload and caseload and, and the practice of law on a day-to-day -day basis? It's challenging, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and, you know, again, and, and somehow we've, you know, after all these years, we've just worked it out. I mean, Doreen and I do a lot of the management, you know, so we're hands-on. I mean, I, when there's issues, I hear about them and try to, work to resolve them but it is always challenging because you know we have a lot of people here and every every person has an issue but i think that's in every office there's office politics there's you know there's always something but you know again we try to be available and stay involved when something arises and i think also being able to know what you defer what not defer but what you um separate out we have an amazing administrative staff so 
I completely have faith in them. So I let them, unless it's, you know, catastrophic, you know, I don't need to be part of it. I mean, they can hire, they can, I mean, they handle it. So it really frees us up to actually, you know, bring in business and practice law, which is a nice thing. Um, so I try to give them as much autonomy as possible. I don't need to have my hand in everything that's going on, but they know that we're here to, you know, do whatever needs to be done in terms of helping out. And it is primarily you and I. Yeah, that, yeah that's what I was going to say. Is management responsibility split between all, all the partners? Is it equal or it falls on certain people that you've agreed upon, namely you guys, I guess. <laughs> and, and again, it just sort of happened organically. It wasn't like we just said, okay, you're doing this. We just sort of assumed certain responsibilities. And again, we've been very lucky. And, you know, like everyone, there's always disagreements. You know, we're not 100% on the same page, but we 100% work it out. How have, you, how have you dealt with that, Dana? So like whether it's around case economics or firm expansion or any of those issues, how do you guys actually do it? I mean, I think that's a challenge for a lot of people in partnerships uh, and obviously in, in marriages that we see in all of our cases, right? But how do you do it with the business wrapper around it? I think, well, first of all, we have professionals that we work with. You know, we have our own professionals. But I also think from, I guess, my, my personal philosophy if it's something that's really important to the other partners, I'll give in. I'm, I'm going to be flexible and compromise. I think you can't have a successful partnership without compromise. So, I mean, I think we all kind of feel strongly about certain different things and we respect one another and work it out. And we've been, like I said, very fortunate so far. But we do, you know, talk to our own professionals, our own, you know, accountants and business managers to help guide us. Uh, when it comes to growth, how do you identify outside talent? How how do you recruit? What's that process? Um, interestingly, um, it runs the gamut. Um, so, for example, we met Dana. I don't even know how I remember how you. Oh, through another through associate, that colleague right. from that went to law school. That's right. This job. So you know, we met Dana by happenstance from another colleague. Um, you know, from law school, we hire you know associates through you know in the very first stages of their law career. Um, we've been known to be in court and be very impressed by someone who's you know, litigating and at a council table and the way they present themselves. And we hope to follow them outside of the courtroom and just say that we are very impressed and they're ever in the market, you know, give us a call. And that has landed us a few, uh, a few leads. Um, but a lot of people have just come to us too. I mean, saying that, you know what, I've always wanted to work for your firm or I've seen you in court or I'm really, you know, impressed by the kind of cases that you guys have and I'd love to be given a chance. And I think if anything anyone can say about our firm is we really give everyone a chance. If you want to come and work hard and we are completely open, we give everybody a chance. What about geography? So we, you're in LA, that's the flagship. You're down in Orange County. How, what was that decision like to, to open up that office? And then what's kind of, do you ever think on the horizon of spreading further afield or is this, is this enough to handle for now? Well, if you were talking to Lisa Meyer, we have uh, offices in San Francisco, Santa Barbara and San Diego. Um, we were scared to death just of Orange County. Again, we're the we're the very timid ones. Um, now, I think Orange County was just a logical kind of progression. I grew up in Orange County, so I have roots there. We all agreed it was a, kind of an untapped market. Um, you have some standards there, but again, they're a little older and retiring, and there was certainly no significant female presence out there, which was a real big thing for us. And one of the associates that we worked a great deal with ended up moving down there. And he really was the impetus for saying like, let me, you know, back me on this. Let me be the person who starts the office and I'll, I'll work it and we'll do something significant with it. And he's been true to form and 
his name's Mark Ehrlich and he's awesome. And so now we have Mark and one, two, three, three, three associates. We just moved into new space and it's beautiful. And um, so it's really, it's, it's, we're creating a nice niche for ourselves down there. So it's been, it's been a positive, a positive experience. But we also have cases all over the state. So we will take other cases. Like right now we have a big, big case and, um, and they're all going up this weekend for depositions in Lake Tahoe. So, mm. you know, we, we always work with local council in the area, but we, you know, we've had cases, have a case in Mammoth or outside of Mammoth, San Diego, Santa Barbara, Bakers, San Francisco. Oh yeah, Bakersfield. Bakersfield, Indio, Riverside. All over. <laughs> and that poses challenges as well, but you know, it's still, it's fun and new. I mean, that actually keeps it's things fun. fresh and you know, we like doing different things. Um, and getting to know the professionals there too, it was great. Yeah. Oh yeah, expanding uh, the network of local mm-hmm. family law attorneys. Yeah. It's fun to see how different people practice. Uh, another question that I that's come to mind just while we're having this conversation for me, what has your personal experience like been um, as a female female attorneys from when you started out, you know, when you started your firm, I think you said in the 90s and to now, have you seen changes? What, what has it been like for you personally? Again, I think I've been I've been very lucky. I've really never had any issue. Family law has always had a lot of women attorneys. So I think the women attorneys mm-hmm. have been supportive. Maybe not, but not certainly very, our, yeah, yeah. But our generation. Right. I mean, when I started, there were a lot of women family law attorneys. Because like, when I started, it was literally, Lisa was like kind of on the incoming floor. And I think it was just like Arlene Coleman Schwimmer and right. um, the woman at Trip. I can't think of her name. So there Mary was Ann LaGuardia. Miriam LaGuardia. Um, right. There was very few. There was like literally four or five, you know, significant women lawyers. And um, when you'd see them in court, it was just like, oh my gosh, look at, there's a woman. I mean, so I think Lisa did her best to try to get out there and be a strong woman. And I remember we went to court, both of us, and we didn't wear hose, pantyhose, and we wore open toed, we wore open toed shoes. And the looks that we got were just, uh, people were mortified and we were just like, I don't get what the big deal is. We're like, we don't care. You know, we're setting a new trend. We're wearing our sandals and we're not wearing pantyhose anymore. And so, I mean, just something as small as that, we actually felt like we made a difference. Um, and I think like, as long as you go into court and you're prepared and you're ready to roll, I think people look at you differently, you know, in terms of when woman, man, whatever, I mean, they see someone who's there ready to go. It's a whole game changer. It's a, actually a really great thing. I've, I've loved seeing that progression. Absolutely. I think my generation probably has no idea what uh, that probably would have been like, <laughs> in, large right. part, in large part due to other people having been there first. But <laughs> right. and, and I kind of, I came in on the very bottom of it, so... You know, I saw it a little bit more firsthand. Um, so it was interesting for me to see kind of the forward progression. Um, and it has been significant. It has been. I mean, it's not even an issue anymore where before it was an issue. The same thing with female judges. You didn't have any female judges or very few. I mean, and now it's, you know, equally distributed, if not more. It's really, it's a nice thing. Has that changed the practice at all? In terms of how having having real representation, has it changed the either the culture or the actual way cases move through the system? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I honestly, I don't know. I don't. In terms of how it's impacted our firm, um, I think it makes it kind of a destination firm, for lack of a better word. Um, some people come to us solely because they like the whole woman thing, um, particularly men. They want a strong woman, you know, representing them, which is great. Um, also, you know, women who feel 
like they've been, you know, that don't have confidence and need someone strong. They love being represented by a strong woman. I mean, I've had so many women say like, God, this is like the best feeling I've had because I'm getting your energy, which is a lovely thing to hear. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, I think it has made an impact. I think it has kind of changed in terms of the way we practice and, and the way we, you know, hold ourselves out in the public too. Um, did you have something to add, Dana? No, I was just going to say, I think, I mean, I've had a lot of clients say to me, both men and women, that they specifically want a woman attorney. They feel more comfortable and, you know, for whatever various reasons. So again, I think being a woman in family law is a good place to be. I agree. (laughs) Um, So just while we're, I can see our time is moving along. So I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to talk about uh, the legal topic, which I know is completely uh, shifting gears from talking about the firm and and the practice. (laughs) But um, the the legal topic that you chose was uh, related matters and consolidating cases and uh, parallel actions going on at the same time as a family law case. So uh, when, you know, just as a big picture question, when does this happen? Can you give us an example of a a related case or a consolidated case that came up in your practice and and how you handled it? Um, Yeah, from my perspective, I think you see it most when, let's say, the parties are in business together and you have that, you know, as a um, asset in your community property, you know, division of assets, but also there's the business aspect of it, you know, as two shareholders in a business and then has there been appropriate disclosures or breaches, um, you know, fraud or whatever the case may be. I mean, that may call for a separate civil suit. So when, you know, if you make that determination, then you're kind of on the same parallel track and it gets a little hard because, everything kind of overlaps. So it's kind of a big decision if you seek or, you know, your opposing party seeks to have the matters consolidated and what that looks like, because now you're operating um, kind of on a parallel track. So it's a lot more, you know, conferences with civil counsel, because you certainly don't want to do anything in the family law action that's going to affect your civil case. So there's a lot more coordination, but there's things to, you know, consider, like you retain that, the rights on a civil case, like a jury trial, or, you know, breach, uh, the uh, remedies for breach, you know, there are different remedies. So you really have to think in terms of your client's best interest, you know, how filing that civil action and it being either consolidated or related, you know, how that's going to impact you and really working in a parallel fashion with your, you know, civil counsel. So what are the main things that family law counsel needs to be looking out for in terms of, is it identifying these issues first uh, or knowing about these conflicts? Does that come down to really getting to know the client and what's going on in their lives? How do you actually discover what's going on here? You know, I think it's um, getting, getting very down to the root of the issues with your clients. Um, You know, when you meet with a client, you do some vetting, you do questions and answers, so you have kind of a topical view. But I think, especially when you have those, you know, business type of issues, to get it really down to the weeds, to find out what other possible issues and remedies there are out there, and how that wouldn't be addressed in a family law context. And then I think, you know, having civil counsel on board, even just to you know, bat your ideas, you know, is this a good idea? What do you think of this type of a claim? And exploring that and maybe in doing that, you'll hear that, oh, there's really just no claim. I mean, you're going to be able to deal with everything in the family law context. So don't even go that route. So I think it's really just asking questions and really getting down to the nuts and bolts of it to figure out if that's even something you should consider and an option for your client. Because again, it's more expensive. Um, So it's not necessarily going to be the right path for every person to go down to the extent that issue comes up. 
And I can give you guys an example where it ended up the opposite. So we were representing a man in a divorce and it was been pending for years. And she, the wife was represented or is and was represented by counsel. And then out of the blue, she filed a separate civil suit alleging things like breach of fiduciary duty and just certain claims that clearly fall within the family court. And I don't know if she did it for leverage. She thought it was going to intimidate him because, you know, there's jury trial and civil, as Doreen said, but you could also get punitive damages, which you can't in family law. So there's different remedies. And we just went into court and the judge, it wasn't even the second thought. The judge said, of course, this is consolidated with the family law court. So, I mean, it was just a ridiculous ploy and obviously, but then made the case more contentious because, you know, raising that issue. Interestingly enough, she also had my client served on Father's Day. So, you know, people do these kind of things. And so when that case was consolidated, what happened to the civil claims? Did they become something that would be tried in the family case? It just sort of got subsumed. I mean, we haven't gone to trial. We actually, after that, we ended up selling the case on Zoom during the pandemic. But, you know, it just got subsumed within the family law case. But, I mean, they weren't separate actions. So... And so generally speaking, well, I know it's everything ends up becoming uh, case specific, but is it becoming more common now for you to have your family law clients or to at least advise them to go and consult with civil counsel to see if to determine if they have potential causes of action? Or is it something that you only would think about in limited circumstances? It's pretty limited. I mean, civil court doesn't right. really want to have anything to do with family law court. So I think they'll kick it to family court whenever they possibly can. So I think, you know, I think to carry on the two different cases is more the exception than the rule. And what if you're not, let's say you're not um, relating or consolidating another matter, like a, sep a separate lawsuit. In what instances do you consult with outside counsel generally, like if there's crossover with probate or criminal or things like that? Oh, I'm such a huge believer in consulting with all my outside professionals. I mean, I'm, I have no ego. I love to hear other people's opinions. I love to hear. And it, invariably, every time I do, I, I find something out that I should have, or I should be thinking about this or this tax implication or a, you know, inheritance tax issue, which is beyond my pay grade. Um, so I, we actually both have a really great network of um, professionals that we work with, that we consult with. And, um, I, I think it's absolutely a must. And I think um, it's interesting. I was working with an associate and she said, you know, it's really great working with your firm because in my other firm, I never was told or um, had the opportunity to go out and pick up the phone and call a, you know, a mental health professional or call a corporate lawyer and ask, you know, what this means in, you know, corporate speak or talk to an estate planning attorney to see if, you know, I should be dissolving the trust at this point or what the ramifications for a client are. She's like, and the fact that your firm has a reputation and a good reputation that we could pick up the phone and call any of these people is such a benefit. And I guess I just become so accustomed to it. It really didn't strike me, but hearing somebody else say that to me, I was kind of very happy to hear that, that that was definitely a plus. So it's, I think it's huge. Yeah. And I think when issues arise and you're not sure, I think it's incumbent upon us professionals to get it checked out. And like Doreen said, we have plenty of other professionals to go to and likewise we reciprocate. So, I mean, I get calls all the time on, you know, random family law issues and I'm always happy to help. So yeah. digging in a little bit in the, in the materials that you provided, uh, thank you first for putting that together. Um, you mentioned towards the end, if, if people want to go through some of the rules, uh, that one of the key cases is Hamilton uh, that guides this process. That was a, argued actually by friend of the program, now Judge David Rosen, uh, way back in the day. And uh, could you walk us through that case a little bit and what the key takeaways there and how you would apply those in practice? You know what? I, what I was looking at, at Hamilton, um, and I think Hamilton stands for the proposition 
don't take things for granted. I mean, the, the defense counsel in that case just was like making all these very broad assumptions in terms of, you know, whether they were served, whether they weren't served. And it all was, it's a very procedural case. And I think it stands for the proposition that know your procedure. I mean, aside from just, and it, it also made very clear that when a court consolidates a matter, you have to get a very clear order from the court. Are you consolidating it for trial purposes only, or are you consolidating it as the entirety of the case? Because it makes a huge difference how you proceed in terms of, you know, pleadings, in terms of hearings, in terms of, you know, notifying everyone for depositions and who you can do that with. So I think just procedurally, it's a really good case for everyone to read. Not that everyone's either relating or consolidating cases, but just about the pitfalls and perils of procedure. Um, it's a really good case. That's what I found it to be anyhow. So I think we're almost uh, out of time. We have a few minutes left and let's take it all the way back to the beginning, kind of where we started with, with, with you as young associates working together um, and, and the, the, the amazing growth since then. So, so when you put yourself back in those shoes um, and thinking now, either what advice do you give young attorneys, whether they work for you or not? Or what, what do you wish you knew when you first started practicing um, that, that you didn't, that you, really, that, that you really want to impart to the community? I mean, from my standpoint, when I, I have spoken to a lot, a lot of law students over the years, and I always just tell people to be open-minded. I mean, I wish I had known. I never took family law. I had no interest in it. Community property was one of my lowest grades in law school. It just was not my thing. But you got to be open-minded. And it's, I really, you know, as Doreen said, so I went to law school with a woman, Stephanie Johnson. She was working with Lisa and Doreen. She knew I was looking for work. She called me. She said, I have the greatest job for you. I went and met these women in court. I was hired. And, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to learn family law. And it's been great. So I think people just need to be flexible in their career choices like I said, it was never on my radar. So I talk to them and I tell them to, and to work hard, you know, to be open-minded and expect that you have to, there's due diligence. You're going to have to try things. You're going to have to do things you don't love doing and just do it. And I think I would say is um, the importance. And I think I just read this in an ABA um, publication, the importance of um, having a mentor. And I think it, it was just a, a good article, but also, I mean, I had an amazing mentor. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. So, um, and I think that when you start practicing, you just don't have that confidence. And I would just tell, you know, every associate, every, you will get there. You will, you know, you can have the confidence, but I think having a mentor walk you through gives you the confidence to get to the next level. You might not get it right, but at least you have someone to talk about it with and hopefully someone who's not judging you and someone who's helping guide the process. Because I think without that, you're like a flotsam in the sea and you have no direction. And we've had those people come to our firm and start, and you can tell those people a mile away because they are so eager to just soak up, you know, any minute they have with you and any guidance that you could provide. Um, and uh, so I just say, find a mentor, get that mentor, you know, just suck them dry and get everything you can out of it because you know what, you'll you'll pay it forward. And people do want to help, you know? Yeah, I love helping. Yeah, I mean, people want to help, people want to help you learn and train you, so. so tell us a little more, I think, um, that, 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 thank you so much for sharing all that. Tell us a little bit more about the fun stuff. What do you guys like to do outside of work? The, the, how do you, how do you decompress? How do you shed this, the, the day to day? And, and, and besides the holiday parties that we talked about, what do you guys do to go have some fun? Friday night, I'm taking my partner, Doreen and her husband and their lovely daughter who's been working here 
since you graduated from undergrad and starting law school, I'm taking them all out to dinner and we'll have some good drinks and have a great time because Olivia, Doreen's daughter, I, I mean, first of all, I held her like the day she was born. So she's like a child of my heart that I love. And, you know, I, I want to, I'm so proud of her and she's been incredible here. So, you know, we socialized. And I think this will be my first, our first time going out to dinner. Oh no, we went out once before during COVID because I was, I was out, I was not going out. But we also, um, we all support each other in our different, you know, charitable endeavors. Right. Lisa has a lot of, you know, um, things that she supports. So we are there in number, you know, at all the benefit dinners and we love a good auction. <laughs> People have been known to hold the paddle up too long. Yes. Um, so we love, you know, supporting each other in those events. We go on little trips together. We go on hikes. We've, um, we've gone to spa retreats together. Um, many times. Many times. We like that. Um, so again, I think it's just, you know, what you work hard, you should enjoy the, the fruits of your, your work efforts and who better than to enjoy them with and the people who help you get there. That's kind of my idea. And, and it's, really amazing um to see people decompress you know it's it's such a stressful job most of the time so when you're actually able to decompress let your hair down you know have a nice cabernet with you um and just sit and and talk about your families i mean we've all known our respective families for 30 years um and lisa's son who used to be this high walking through the office he's now an associate at our firm so, I mean, I've seen him since he was a little boy. So it's really fun and it really is a family. It's nice. We're very fortunate. Well, that's a really nice note for us to end things on right on time. Right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dana and Doreen, for taking the time to, to share with us today. We'll wrap things up and we'll ask that everyone uh, please mark your calendars to join us for our next episodes, which are all going to be at 1230 on the first Wednesday of the month, except in January. Um, We have just as a reminder, Bob Brandt in September, uh, Betty Nordwind in October, Joe Manis in November, Judge Elizabeth Scully in December, Christina Royce in January. That's the one that's going to be on the 12th and Larry Ginsburg in February. Registration links are available now on the BHBA calendar. Um, We want to thank Genna, Alex, and Belinda at the bar, the uh, Family Law Executive Committee, which is led by Carrie Holmes and Ron Reichstein, and of course, all of our section sponsors. Uh, Most importantly, above all else, (laughs) thank you again, Dana and Doreen, for being here and sharing with us. Uh, We hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you, guys, for everything you do. Thank you, and thanks for inviting us. us. It was nice getting to talk with you both. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. (laughs) All right. Bye. Bye.